Hello and welcome. I'm excited to present a fresh review of the Canadian Federation of Library Associations Statement on Intellectual Freedom and Libraries. We have some proposed revisions that we hope will spark discussion in this session and beyond. Thinking of our fellow information workers in Ukraine, as we discuss the statement, let's keep in mind how our actions here link to the broader international community that we work with and the human rights of all, not only those in Canada. In this brief presentation, we aren't doing a complete analysis, but we aim to explain some of the strengths to make use of and some ways we could see strengthening the statement in future revisions. We've considered the global context of intellectual freedom in order to better understand our Canadian statement and what may have otherwise been taken for granted, considering our position of privilege studying and working in a liberal democratic society. We will not be addressing in-depth case studies of how the statement has been applied or legal information on civil rights. The Statement on Intellectual Freedom in Libraries is one of several documents that outline library values and sits alongside the CFLA's Code of Ethics as a critical resource for libraries and library workers in their defense of access to and expression of knowledge. It also serves to clarify the responsibilities of library associations and institutions in contrast to professional ethics. SAMIC 2002 explains that, quote, equity, access, and privacy are core library values related to and subsumed by the ethic of intellectual freedom, end quote. And so the CFLA statement also contains implicitly a commitment to these core library values. The CFLA draws their de definition of intellectual freedom from the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights as being, quote, the interlocking freedoms to hold opinions and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers, end quote, CFLA 2019. The statement references and supports the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as the legal foundation for the guarantees needed to be able to freely engage with ideas in society. The statement formally articulates a commitment to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which itself acts as, quote, a guarantor of the fundamental freedoms in Canada, end quote, CFLA. 2019. The purpose of the statement is to declare that libraries have an obligation to safeguard the intellectual rights and freedoms of all people in Canada as far as the law permits. The statement affirms the Canadian library community's connection with IFLA by echoing their statement and aligning with the international library community in protecting intellectual freedom. The statement is the key connection for any library facing a challenge to demonstrate the strength of community and linkages with professional expectations in defending intellectual freedom. While the statement points to the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, global intellectual freedom statements are tied to a wide variety of national and international legislation. Similar to Canada, the Council for the Development of Social Re Science Research in Africa points to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights in the Kampala Declaration on Intellectual Freedom and Social Responsibility. Conversely, for example, the CFLA, IFLA, and the New Zealand Library Association appeal to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, while the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals in the UK and the Japan Library Association do not appeal to any legislation. As an example of what can be learned globally, Ukraine passed a law on libraries and librarianship, IFLA 2005, that protects intellectual freedom, libraries, and librarians names a social responsibility to society, and explicitly aims to democratize libraries. Well, the immediate audience of the CFLA Statement on Intellectual Freedom in Libraries includes library associations and institutions. The statement broadly applies to the parties involved in the establishment and provision of library services. On a structural level, the intended audience begins with the legislators whose decisions impact the creation and revision of the statement, which in turn affects the policies and translates to on-the-ground enforcement for library workers. Given that libraries operate under institutional governing bodies that fund them, such as municipalities, academic institutions, and school boards, the statement implicates all parties involved in the protection of libraries and library services. This statement also protects interest groups' rights to free expression. Those lobbying to ban books will be interacting with the statement, making them an important audience. As we look to make revisions, we must keep in mind that opposition groups will be reading against this text and aiming to pull it apart for their own goals. Less directly, the statement also addresses members of the Canadian public. The ability for any member of the public to access information unimpeded is sometimes expected and taken for granted within Canada. This ability is driven by the work of the statement and those that champion it. 
We shouldn't forget the end user as we think about the audience of this statement and should consider drawing public attention to the ways in which libraries are working to protect everyday freedoms. Librarians and library associations collaborate internationally to advance core values in partnership with IFLA. The statement on intellectual freedom is a key piece in that collaboration and serves librarians in efforts to combat censorship for all based on global human rights. Therefore, the audience is also international in scope when we see others look to Canada for support. In considering strengths of the statement, the first is the broad reach. It names all persons in Canada as having these rights, not only Canadian citizens or even permanent residents. This language helps intellectual freedom defenders to protect a wider swath of potentially marginalized people, including temporary foreign workers, landed immigrants, permanent residents, refugees, and people with no fixed address, sought in 2015. The statement successfully embodies the values of liberal democracy. In comparison with other statements, it doesn't mention loyalty, obedience, or religious beliefs, and it reinforces the democratic ideals that we may take for granted. Another strength is the frequency of review and revision. For many years, it remained unchanged, but in recent years, it has been updated almost biannually. This shows a commitment to keeping the focus of the statement relevant as changes occur in the library and information services community and in society at large. It also allows the CFLA to address criticisms of the statement and to try and make necessary changes. The statement is explicitly clear that the breadth of expression guaranteed to library users is limited only by Canadian law. Lack of limits may be perceived as a weakness since some legal expressions threaten the humanity of others, but that breadth is necessary in order for libraries to do the work of fighting for equity and social justice. Atkin, 2012, criticized a former rendition of the statement for overpromising freedom of expression that is not possible since courts may override charter rights within reasonable limits to prevent harm to society. Recent revisions make these legal limits clear. The statement lacks legal authority in the sense that it has no legal weight of its own, nor any measures to ensure its directives are followed. The statement calls on the Charter for legal support and claims it recognizes the Charter as the guarantor of fundamental freedoms in Canada, but does not recognize that the Charter rights may compete with each other. In Canadian law, rights are weighted against each other using proportionality to determine the, quote, reasonableness of the claim which seeks to trump another protected Charter right, end quote. Atkin 2012. The author cites a case in British Columbia School where books with gay and lesbian content were retained in grade one classrooms because the right to equality was measured to trump the right to religion in publicly funded schools. We suggest the addition of a statement acknowledging competing charter rights as shown on the slide. This would aid the minority vulnerable groups most in need of support having their freedom of expression championed in a society where barriers are still inherent in power structures of any government institution, including libraries. The statement, despite not using the word, does appeal to neutrality and is based on outdated neoliberal ideals, Popovich 2021, in its expectation of individual self-determinism. While this neutrality can be used to protect a larger number of people and ideas, Canadian library institutions need to recognize that intellectual freedom and neutrality have historically been tools of existing power structures. As an extension of neutrality, the statement also fails to acknowledge institutional commitment to social responsibility, as outlined in the CFLA Code of Ethics. Acknowledgement of social responsibility is necessary in the statement because without it, there cannot be universal access to intellectual freedom. The document declares all persons in Canada have the fundamental rights to express opinions and access the fullest possible range of thoughts yet fails to articulate the reality that many barriers exist to disproportionately limit this access to many potential users. The statement passively says that library services should be offered without discrimination, but it must go further to state libraries should actively counter discrimination in order to guarantee the same breadth of intellectual freedom for underrepresented and marginalized groups. The addition could state, intellectual freedom is required in order to advance social responsibility. Libraries have a core responsibility to acknowledge the historical and existing power structures that present barriers to individuals and the impact that has on their access to the right of intellectual freedom. Indigenous ways of knowing have been historically ostracized by Western practices of librarianship. Andrew and Humphreys 2016, the outcome of which must be acknowledged in the statement to instill institutional changes. 
The CFLA must acknowledge the First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have lived in the land now known as Canada since time immemorial in the statement. The CFLA should instruct libraries to collaborate with Indigenous communities to help inform intellectual freedom policies and overall library services. Burns et al. 2018. This would recognize that CFLA ideas on intellectual freedom do not supersede Indigenous ways of knowing, nor are they necessarily relational. The statement lacks methods of enforcement. Librarianship in Canada is not a regulated profession, and the legislation of library services does not address values. Institutions are not required to comply with the directives of the CFLA and often face conflicting pressures from stakeholders. However, SAMIC 2002 argues that this is where ethics come into play, and in fact, quote, Canadian library ethics have been built and shaped on the philosophical foundation of intellectual freedom, end quote. Whenever there is risk in workplace speech, the integrity of intellectual freedom in libraries is compromised. Dilapina McCook, 2008. We must also consider structural inequities for librarians and information workers who hold intersecting marginalized identities and face greater consequences. Pursuing an amendment on workplace speech and directing libraries to support workers engaging in professional dialogue to protect intellectual freedom would foster work environments where self-censorship is reduced. We do continue to seize challenges to libraries and the statement needs more teeth to it if we want to mount effective defenses of intellectual freedom. Amending the statement itself cannot add enforceability. However, it can direct library actions in ways that are enforceable, such as the inclusion of workplace speech in collective agreements, Saskatoon Public Library 2017, or the creation of an advertised legal defense fund. We propose to add to the statement, this responsibility extends to both workplace speech and to participation in professional and public dialogue in support of the principles of intellectual freedom. This extension would make it clear that librarians and other information workers are expected to engage with this issue as individual professionals outside of the workplace and should not be restricted by fear of workplace repercussions. This is needed in particular because libraries are often under the purview of municipal or education services, which can have code of conduct policies that are intended to restrict employee speech on issues that are perceived as political. Even Library and Archives Canada has struggled with this, Gruber 2013. We would recommend further inquiry into whether professionalization of librarianship could offer strength in embedding a culture of action for intellectual freedom that can be upheld in the face of political pressures. We would also recommend consideration of the current status of the legal defense fund that existed previously, as noted by SAMIC 2017, but five years later is still not advertised by the CFLA. In public libraries, some users' main vehicle for information is through public access computers and the internet. Internet filtering restricts a user's access to certain content and can act as a form of censorship. The CFLA statement on intellectual freedom does not address challenges that are unique to the web, and the public access to the internet position statement does not address intellectual freedom. According to the American Library Association, quote, the use of internet filters to block constitutionally protected speech, including content on social networking and gaming sites, compromises First Amendment freedoms and the core values of librarianship, end quote. ALA 2006. Internet filters are known to be unreliable and have been consistently found to both overblock and underblock the content they claim or attempt to filter. ALA 2006. Further, internet filtering is often covert, as users don't know that certain content has been removed. Schultz 2020. Access to the internet is itself an issue impacted by inequity, and it is often those with the greatest need that are most affected by internet filtering. In our digital world, information is accessed more than ever through the internet, and this unique issue should be addressed in the Statement on Intellectual Freedom in Libraries. Addressing broader internet restriction is also important, as government censorship of information is an active threat to information and intellectual freedom in other nations. Sabanchi, 2019. The CFLA statement is important nationally, but also serves as grounds to support the international community. Our recommendation is to investigate how digital information could be specifically addressed in the statement. Both currently and historically, intellectual freedom informs the core of Canadian library philosophy and the associated ethical framework, SAMIC 2002. The statement on intellectual freedom in libraries is only as strong as our construction and defense of it. It needs to be adapted to the current context with care, taught in the library context, and applied in public spheres to demonstrate the core democratic value of libraries in an age of increasing challenges and misinformation. We've summarized our key points for consideration on a takeaway handout. Now let's move on to the conversation.